Hello and welcome to this Politico video. My name's James Paniki. I'm Politico's lobbying and transparency reporter and transparency reforms have been all over the news in the course of this week as a result of the fact that the first vice president of the European Commission, Franz Timmermans, was here in Parliament in the course of the week and the news he had was not necessarily good for supporters of transparency reforms and that was that the transparency reforms that had been slated for the end of this year have in fact been deferred until uh, possibly early next year but uh, at the very least next year. Now uh, Sven Gilgold is with me here in Parliament today. He's a German Greens MEP and he is the Committee on Constitutional Affairs Rapporteur on Transparency, Accountability and Integrity. Sven Gilgold, thank you very much for your time. Is timing a big deal? I mean, Timmerman says it's not going to be this year, it's going to be next year. Is that a big deal? Well, it is not a big deal, but a disappointment because uh, there's no objective reason why to wait uh, for the public consultation on the matter of lobby transparency. I think uh, transparency is important in Brussels uh, to regain trust with the citizens. Therefore, waiting uh, is not a good message. Well, he says, let's get rid of uh, better regulation, let's get that off the table, and then we'll move on to uh, transparency. He's only got so much emotional energy that he can spend on these things. Is that a fair point? Well, I think uh, it's a bit besides the point, because uh, the truth is, uh, this better regulation deal was very much a wish of himself, but also of the Juncker Commission. So he wants to assure that Parliament supports in the end a deal, uh, only then afterwards he wants to do something which the Parliament always wanted more of, and that is lobby transparency. So therefore there is a political angle to so it. So he's saying, look, let me get through my stuff first and then I'll come to yours. Exactly, and that is, not, uh, is neither logical from the substance uh, nor very nice uh, from the process. Now, you've come up with this draft report which is extremely ambitious in terms of all of the uh, proposals it puts forward when it comes to transparency. Is it too ambitious in the sense that you've got to get this draft report through committees, you've got to get the uh, major parties on board if it's going to make its way through to plenary. Uh, is any of this actually going to get off the drawing board? Oh, some certainly, and I received quite a lot of support yesterday in the AFCO committee, where, so the Constitutional Affairs Committee, all the political parties declared that the direction is right and they want to have discussions about the details. Well, that's, Obviously, that's where the problems start. Exactly, yeah. and therefore um, my report uh, is a and that's how I've seen it, the basis for the debate. And I wanted to have the ambitious agenda proposed in order then to hear from the other groups what is what they can support and what is where we have to compromise. So you're expecting the other groups to push back on a number of these issues? Yes, but I hope also that some will propose a bit more because even if the list is quite long, uh, I had to cut out a lot of my own proposals to keep in the size limit because the agenda for transparency and accountability in Europe is really a long one. I've spoken to a lot of lobbyists and they don't like the look of this. Uh, they say, look, this is again the far left of Parliament wanting to exclude us across the board. They don't want any lobbyists in this parliamentary complex. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, interesting. Uh, please send me some of them because I think that is... Uh, a report which is uh, totally pro-European in its uh, ambition and uh, the German Greens are certainly not far left. Mm. Uh, and, uh, but we are in favor of transparency and, de and strong democracy. And staying to the issue, uh, what is uh, uh, the role of lobbyists in policy making? I am not against lobbying at all. I think uh, lobbying is necessary because you cannot take public decisions without speaking to the ones uh, who are concerned. And this is not denied in any way, but it is a problem that some interests in society have a lot of money to get their views organized and listened to, and others uh, get hardly any access. But and, that's always and going to be the way, though, isn't it? I mean, well, there's, that there's have nothing... you said. Yes. I would say uh, the inequality between different interests has grown enormously. So lobbying in Europe in that style is a relatively new phenomenon. So that you see these large lobby firms, law firms, with a lot of money here in Brussels, uh, that has increased a lot. 
lot. And therefore also the inequality, because some interests uh, have hardly any voice uh, on, on the side of the lobbyists. And therefore it is important that at least there's full transparency. And that is not granted yet. Now, one of the proposals you've put forward is in a way similar to uh, the system that's already in place in the Commission, and that is that the uh, presidents or the, the, the chairs of committees and the rapporteurs would have to disclose their uh, contact with lobbyists uh, and they would also have to, um, so they'd have to only meet with lobbyists who are signed up to the register but also uh, disclose what meetings had taken place. Why limit it uh, to just the, uh, the chairs and the rapporteurs rather than all MEPs? Well, I personally uh, report all my lobby meetings and many other Greens do as well. We have just introduced a new software which we offer through Transparency International to everyone where you can publish your lobby meetings with just two clicks in your Outlook and it's done. So uh, there's no bureaucracy argument anymore. So I would prefer if everybody would be doing it. But as you can see how pragmatic my report is, so uh, some sentences before you said it would be so radical left uh, and now you criticize it for not being ambitious enough. But I appreciate to have more pressure uh, from outside actors to have everything published. I would be the first to uh, uh, to sign up. You know what uh, a lot of the criticisms about this kind of mandatory reporting, uh, what it comes down to. Uh, for example, the CONT um, committee president Ingeborg Gressel mm -hmm. says, look, this is uh, uh, adding a level of bureaucracy in my direct relationship with my electorate. I'm happy to report things, but if an MEP is so compromised by his or her relationship with lobbyists, then it's a problem for the electorate to deal with. They can kick him or her out of office. Well, first of all, uh, most uh, lobbyists never vote uh, here, so um, they are not the electorate, the classic electorate. So nobody is proposing, if an MEP speaks to a citizen, that you have to disclose that. It's about actors who are not here as citizens, but as representatives of organized interests. What about and a whistleblower, if an MEP has to meet exactly. with a whistleblower who is also a lobbyist? I well, mean but a whistleblower, mm. by definition, is someone who does not as a lobbyist speak to you, but he speaks to you because he has information to disclose. Be beyond that, um, I would never say that uh, there cannot be reasons why certain things are not disclosed. So there's no police in any of the MEP's offices or in the Commission's offices. Mm -hmm. And if somebody informally speaks to President Juncker today, uh, he will not disclose that on his uh, list. But if you are approaching somebody who is in a democratic function, in your official uh, role as a lobbyist, then you should be public. It is in America, it is in Canada, and it will uh, not fall, bring Europe to fall apart. And that's for all lobbyist NGO, NGOs of as course. much as, uh, of as, course. as uh, business of representatives. Course. This brings us to the taxi committee argument. Now this, is, this idea has been floating around for quite some time, and that is to uh, compel uh, companies to appear at hearings or committee uh, meetings that they've been required to attend by saying to them, look, unless you show up, uh, we might deny access to the parliamentary facilities to your lobbyists. Now, is this a fair way of twisting the arm of industry and, and forcing it to take these hearings seriously? Why is it not fair? Well, because these uh, they're not legally compelled to attend these meetings. And um, we are not legally compelled to let lobbyists into our house. But is that not an overreaction to, to no. deny them? No, I, I think it is a totally unacceptable behaviour. If, uh, if a democratic parliament invites an actor, uh, you should be proud of being invited. You should not say, oh no, that's a, an unpleasant subject, it will not be good PR for us and therefore I don't come. That is destroying the trust in this house which is uh, important for the credibility of the European project. And therefore that there is a sanction if you deny systematically uh, to give witness, uh, th that is fully legitimate. And. Uh, well, and it's only about whether you grant access to the premises. Of course, all MEPs remain free in the freedom of their mandate to speak to these lobbyists outside. Mm. And uh, though it, it does come down to uh, the, the, the future of the taxi committee, now a lot of members of the taxi committee say, well, in a way, 
all we need is the court of public opinion. And they say, look, all we have to do, and that's happened recently, is to uh, say in public, look, these companies are not appearing, uh, are refusing to appear, uh, and therefore this is outrageous. And then the public relations value of that is enough to compel these companies to show up. Do you need that additional step? Well, uh, it's quite interesting. Of the uh, 14 companies, uh, I think four are still on our list which haven't appeared. So all the bad public relations has not helped. And for them, a sanction is legitimate. But uh, I'm, I'm sure we will try to re-invite them so they get another chance. What about side jobs for politicians? All members of parliament are at the moment free to uh, seek employment outside of parliament. Uh, Presumably they would declare if, if there was some kind of uh, conflict of interest. Is this something that needs greater regulation? Well, uh, I would say there has to be distinguished between side jobs while you are an MEP and side jobs after. Oh, let's so, do, uh, deal with the first one, the the first first sitting one. MEPs for so people sit, like you. Well, there I would say uh, being an MEP is more than a full-time job, at least if you take it seriously, so that you normally have, don't have any time for anything else. And therefore, in my report, uh, I suggest uh, that at least half of the income uh, of what you make outside should be deducted from your salary so that there's an economic incentive but a, not a clear rule you may not do anything else because there might be some occupations uh, where you basically are forced to continue on a certain level in order not to lose it. So therefore I'm not against that people to a certain degree work outside but, but, I, but at then but then their salary here should be a bit reduced. But, but that is a disincentive. If someone's a, oh, yeah. a world famous brain surgeon who needs to keep up his or her skills, is there anything wrong with that person uh, working outside of no, the No, not at all. But, but if this person earns a good money outside, they have less time here. So why should the taxpayer provide the same money if somebody is still busy for long periods of time uh, to do operations outside. I have nothing mm. against it. So therefore I didn't suggest to have any strict rules. There are parliaments where this is really not allowed. I'm not in favor of that because I think we should have all different occupations uh, in a parliament and we should not basically forbid uh, people with certain professional backgrounds. On the issue of the revolving door, in a way the Commission is a few steps ahead of Parliament because the Commission has its uh, ad hoc committee that looks into uh, possible problems when it comes to uh, former officials or former high-ranking officials of the Commission uh, seeking employment once they've left the Commission. Parliament doesn't have this kind of system in place. Uh, is this a problem and how do you remedy that? Well, uh, I think first of all it's a problem that in the Commission it's only for the highest level of staff. Many of the key members of staff in the Commission who prepare law, uh, they can immediately switch sides and we have seen the cases, people working on mergers and acquisitions uh, or um, in the competition field when it came to state aid, they could work on cases for the public side and switch then uh, to law firms and earn a lot more. In the parliament, uh, we had the same cases. So take Sharon Bowles. She was probably the key parliamentarian for all the financial reforms. After she was five years chair of ECON last mandate, was really key to all all the legislation, uh, she is now with the London Stock Exchange, also uh, in a role to advise on public policy. And, and she's perfectly and she, entitled to do that under exactly, current rules? No, there's, there's no, problem no limits. That. And I have a problem with it because I, the citizens uh, will lose trust in an institution where revolving doors are not regulated. Uh, of course it is fully legitimate for an MEP after uh, being an MEP to be again in the private sector. But you should not be able to sell directly the knowledge you have acquired here in order to make a private gain. But they've got to, even former presidents of committees, former chairs of committees have got to make a living. Um, and so it, it might, if you put uh, um, uh, perhaps a, a two or three year um, moratorium on, on, on them seeking work outside of parliament, you do constrain them and in a way uh, inhibit their ability to, 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 to earn money to live. Yeah, uh, obviously therefore um, most jobs are fully unproblematic but if you move directly as an MEP to a lobby job in the same field where you have been before legislating, that is raising the following danger and question. Have you already, when you were in the public job, 
as an MEP taken into consideration, you might want to work uh, for a certain private actor and therefore not being so tough. And because that question is open, it is needed uh, to have rules of separation. So taking back to the example of uh, Sharon Bowles, she had a perfect reputation. Uh, she was clearly very competent and she was before a patent lawyer. Uh, there wouldn't have been any problems if she continued doing patent law, uh, law uh, but financial lobbying and uh, financial advi giving advice to financial services comp corporations after what, you have, uh, what she had done here is clearly raising questions in the eyes of the citizens. Let's talk about the transparency register. It must be a tough life for those 4.5 full-time equivalent staffers yeah. who, who work on, in, in the secretariat. They're being asked to monitor this, this massive operation. Is there any talk about, uh, is, is there any sense in talking about the future of the transparency register without addressing the staffing issue? Well, uh, I, I would say first of all, as it is, it is progress. Mm. So we have much more information than in most member states parliaments. So Europe is in many transparency issues ahead. But so it's, it's unreliable better, information. Though. Exactly. I mean, it's, the it's... information is, uh, if, if you look at it, it is quite easy to detect uh, immediately incoherent cases and uh, NGOs have done that, journalists have done it and therefore there needs to be more staffing uh, and uh, I demand that in my report and you can see in Canada where you also have a lot of registration processes they have 20 people working on the register and, uh, and Canada is a bit smaller place uh, concerning lobbying than Brussels. Now, when it comes to whistleblowers, uh, the Ombudsman has reported on the fact that many institutions in the European Union are lagging behind in terms of their legal responsibilities to implement safeguards for whistleblowers. Parliament is one of those institutions which has been criticised by the Ombudsman. Is there any, any point in your draft report talking about your ambitions for, uh, for whistleblower protections when Parliament itself has yet to implement adequate protections? Well, uh, following that logic, uh, I couldn't have proposed anything outside of Parliament because uh, obviously that's not how politics functions. But mm. I agree, the Parliament also has to uh, take its word seriously and uh, there is a problem in many European institutions, in many member states. We have seen it with the big taxa cases. So we wouldn't know about LuxLeaks mm. without, uh, on the one hand, a whistleblower, on the other hand, journalists. Mm. And uh, therefore, it's really needed uh, to have uh, rules all over Europe. When I was legislating, uh, for instance, for investment funds, we managed uh, to, to enforce that all member states have to protect whistleblowers when it comes to the big investment fund business. But there are many areas where there is no protection and therefore we demand the directive which sets a minimum standards for everyone. But unfortunately, Mr. Timmerman, so far the Juncker Commission is not ready to propose any law. Sven Gilgold, thank you very much for your time.